So the second phylum that we must understand is phylum Cnidaria. So remember that in our evolutionary history and animal diversity, the first phylum to uh, emerge is phylum Periphera. Phylum Periphera was a part of the Perizoan clade and it was asymmetrical. So now we have another phylum that's diverged and that's phylum Cnidaria. Phylum Cnidaria is a part of the Eumetazoan clade. Eumetazoan, remember, it means that true tissues are present. So periphera was um, periphera was perizoan, so it had no true tissues. Cnidarians are eumetazoans, and all of the organisms here on forward will be eumetazoans, so they will have true tissue. Okay, so uh, the cnidarians are also mainly aquatic species. What's unique to the cnidarians now in comparison to the periphera is that the cnidarians are predators, and they are predators because they are able to use their tentacles to capture and kill prey. So uh, when we talk about uh, cnidarians, the common names for uh, the organisms within this phylum are the sea anemones, the corals, the hydra, and the jellyfish. And what's also important to know about the Cnidarians is that they are they are our ancient Eumetazoans. These are our ancient Eumetazoans that we are concerned with. Everything else will be Eumetazoan from here on forward, but these are the ancient ones that we should know. So moving on forward, the Cnidarians are diploblastic. So since they have true tissue, the next question we have to ask is that is it diploblastic or triploblastic? Because whenever we have tissues, we must have some sort of symmetry. Remember that in the periphera, they were perizoans. That means they had no true tissue. If they have no true tissue, they were asymmetrical. But now we're dealing with tissue, so we have to ask, what's the symmetry? Um, and how many tissue layers do we have? So here we have diploblastic. Diploblastic means two layers of tissue. And within Cnidaria, we have ectoderm and we have endoderm, but we do not have mesoderm. So we have two, uh, we have those two cell layers, ecto and endoderm, therefore it is diploblastic. We also have radial symmetry, and we'll get to that in a second, specifically to see an example of radial symmetry. Remember that there is either radial or bilateral. The cnidarians are radial and diploblastic. Once again, similar to the periphera, the cnidarians do not have a coelom. They do not have that uh, inner cavity. So for locomotion, we have two different types of cnidarians. That's important to note, first of all. We can either have a polyp or we can have a medusa cnidarian. If the cnidarian is a polyp, it will be sessile and not able to move. If the cnidarian is a medusa, then it will be motile and able to move. So when we think about our coral, right over here, we have a diagram of coral. We can see that the coral does not move. Therefore, it must be a polyp and it must be sessile. But if we take a look at our jellyfish over here, it's mobile. We know the jellyfish is mobile, so it must be a medusa. So in regards to feeding strategy, essentially what happens is that the food in within the uh, water surrounding the organism, uh, the food is pulled inside into its gastrovascular cavity. And we'll get into more detail about that as well and uh, and talk about how the tentacles are used to pull in the food. In regards to reproduction, uh, once again, it can be sexual or asexual, similar to the periphera. We can see budding uh, in the cnidarians as well. When we talk about the nervous system, we have a very rudimentary nervous system. We don't have a brain, but we do have contractile tissues and nerves in their simplest form. And we'll see that uh, within our jellyfish. For respiration and excretion, once again, remember that these uh, the cnidarians do not have many layers of cells. So most of their cells are in direct contact with the surrounding water. So they are able to respire and excrete 
simply through diffusion. Now, if we take a look at the two different categories of cnidarians, we have the sessile polyp, or we can have a motile medusa. So if uh, our cnidarian is a polyp, it would either be a hydra uh, or a sea anemone, or as we just mentioned earlier, the coral. And they have a cylinder type of form, and they adhere to a substrate by the aboral end of their body and extend their tentacles waiting for prey. Now it's important to remember that jellies are not the only ones that have tentacles. Our hydras and sea an an anemones are also able to have these tentacles. And what they do, instead of swimming around and capturing prey through their tentacles, they just attach to a substrate they attach to the substrate and they poke their tentacles out and they wait for prey to come to them. But our motile medusa, it resembles in its physical structure, it resembles a sessile polyp, but it is able to move around either by just passive drifting or by contracting its bell-shaped body. So this is our Medusa over here, and we can see that it resembles a bell. So by contracting motion, it is also able to move. And if we take a look at these two, they look very similar. This is just the upside down version of this, and it's a little bit more flat. This one is more elongated. This is our polyp, and this is our Medusa. Medusas are mobile, polyps are not mobile. Now what's interesting is that some cnidarians can have a polyp life stage and a medusa life stage, but other cnidarians may be restricted to only one type, uh, one type of life cycle. And we'll, we'll see that in the next slide. But let's get into tentacles. So we know that the unique characteristic to the cnidarians are their tentacles, which uh, are used to capture prey. So essentially, the tentacles of the cnidarians are lined with, uh, with cnidocytes. These cells are unique to these organisms. These cnidocytes contain nidae. This is important. These nidae are capsule-like organelles. So they are organelles. They are capsule-like that can explode outward. Okay, so we have these cnidocytes that contain nidae, and these nidae are able to explode outward. Why is this important? Because we want to know about how, uh, how the tentacles are used for stinging. So we have these cells called nematocytes, and nematocytes are specialized nidae. These nematocytes are what are responsible for the stinging thread that can penetrate the body of the cnidarian's prey. So this is very important. Essentially, we have a tentacle that is lined with cnidocytes. These cells contain nidae, and our nematocytes are specialized nidae, which are the stringing thread which will penetrate the body of the cnidarian's prey, and the cnidarian will then consume, use that prey as food. So understanding uh, these cnidocytes, nidae, and nematocytes is extremely important, and we should know the difference between polyp and medusa. Now, in regards to digestion, as I mentioned previously, uh, the digestion of cnidarians is related to their tentacles being able to draw in food with, into their gastrovascular cavity uh, through their mouth. So they don't have, they don't exactly have a mouth, it's more of just an opening to their gastrovascular cavity. So the food is pushed into the cavity and this is where digestion begins. Enzymes will be released into the cavity and they will break down the food and the linings on the inside of that cavity will absorb the nutrients from the food. And obviously, any undigested food particles will be excreted exactly where they came from because the cnidarian gastrovascular cavity exhibits two-way traffic. So if this is our cavity, we'll have food coming in and we'll have uh, the undigested food particles going out. So 
uh, it's, it's, a, it's a single opening and two things are happening. So essentially, it, it, we have a mouth and an anus in one opening. So to reiterate, the food comes in through the tentacles into the gastrovascular cavity. Enzymes are secreted inside. They break down the food. The lining of the cavity uh, cells will absorb the food, the nutrients, uh, the nutrients and the undigested food particles will exit exactly where they came from. Now, this is the image of the symmetry that I mentioned earlier. Just so you know, bilateral symmetry is you can split something directly in half, and like this, uh, like this insect over here, and both sides will look the same. But for radial symmetry, we have this central region, and we are dividing in these cross sections, and this is radial symmetry. So our cnidarians exhibit radial symmetry. So terms that we should know, diploblast, uh, this is very important to understand. It means two cell layers. And then in the case of cnidarians, we have ectoderm and endoderm and no mesoderm. We have radial symmetry, which means symmetry about a central axis. So central axis, and we have uh, these multiple axes. Uh, Nidarians are eumetazoan, which means they have true tissue present. It is really important to know what eumetazoan means. It means true tissue. Nidarians can either exist as polyps or as medusa. Polyp is sessile, medusa is motile. The, med uh, the medusa uh, reproduces only sexually, whereas the polyp can produce sexually or asexually through budding. This is also important to know. That the polyp can do both but the medusa can only do sexually now within the cnidarians there are two clades and we can take a good guess at what those clades are going to be it's going to be the clade that has the polyps and the clades that have a medusa so the polyp clade is known as clade anthozoa uh, and obviously these will be the polyps these will be the sessile cnidarians they can exist either solitary, all by themselves, or within a colony, and they often uh, form symbiosis with the algae. So they can exist with the algae and work together. They also have hard exoskeletons made up of calcium carbonate. This is also important. This makes a good quest test question. What is the exoskeleton of anthozoans made of? Calcium carbonate. Now the clade meta uh, medusazoans has the cnidarians that have a medusa stage but it does not mean that they only have a medusa stage they may also have a polyp stage so uh, essentially uh, the clade medusa zoans have medusa stage but hydrozoans which are a part of the medusa zoan clade they alternate between medusa and polyp and the scyphozoans and the cubozoans spend most of their life in the polyp stage but they do also have a medusa stage so medusas, just like the anthozoans, can exist solitary, uh, alone, or uh, in a colony. And the three subgroups of the medusazoans are scyphozoans, cubozoans, and hydrozoans. They are categorized based on how much time they spend in their polyp stage and medusa stage, and based on their physical characteristics. The scyphozoans are the jellies, the cubozoans are box, boxy jellies, and then we have our hydrozoans. These hydrozoans will have uh, we'll have alternate generations of the medusa and polyp stage. Scyphozoans and cubozoans will spend most of their life in the polyp stage. And here we can see the diagrams of the medusazoans and the anthozoans. We can obviously tell by looking at the anthozoans that these are sessile organisms, whereas these medusazoans, they are moving around. We can see them moving around because they are mobile. And this is just a quick representation of the two different alternate life cycles. We can either have uh, our medusa stage, so we see the medusa growing, it's, it's able to move, or we can have that polyp stage where it is sessile. And that is the cnidarians. What's important to remember about cnidarians? They are eumetazoans. They have radial symmetry, they are diploblastic. We have either sessile polyps or we have motile medusa, and we have two clades within 
uh, within the Araneidarians, that's the Anthozoans and the Medusazoans. And that is essentially Araneidarians.